Good, good evening, good evening. Welcome to, to Gumbo Live. I'm here at the Bread Basket downtown Eufaula, Alabama, and we're glad. And I'm, I'm privileged, I'm very privileged to have our district attorney with us, Mr. Ben Reeves is with us. Uh, I'm very proud. I told him to help my ratings, man. My <laughs> ratings go sky. <laughs> I don't uh, know about that. You, you are, you are, uh, with all sincerity, you're one of the most popular district attorneys in the area. Well, you know, I don't know if that's good. Well, <laughs> I, I appreciate well, that, it. That, that, that's your label, whether, yeah. Thank yes, sir. And I, and I, I want to, first of all, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you. And, and I know you got a busy schedule. You've got two counties. Do we have at Barber and Bullock County? Barber and Bullock County. Actually, it's probably almost like three counties, since Barber County is a split county. Mm. So they treat the Clayton Division basically like a separate county. Oh, okay. So when okay. it comes to you know jury trials, when it comes to grand juries, the Clayton Division has its own separate, basically court system. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. Ufaula does, just like Bullock County does. Mm -hmm. Now, now, now let's let, let's let's do this. Let's do this. You don't mind, sir? Tell us, tell us. You you, you said. Jury, tell us how, how, how do a, you may help me help me word this. How do a case get to the jury? I mean, okay. give, give us a process. Because probably, probably the easiest way to do this is just sort of a step by step. Uh, I always call it a criminal history, criminal procedure 101. Okay. Sort of step by step. Okay. Usually, what you have is you start out. Uh, first of all, the crimes committed. Then you have law enforcement that hopefully work the crime, law enforcement hopefully solve it, law enforcement hopefully make an arrest. Uh, once that arrest is made, that person's of course taken to jail, they have an opportunity to have a 72 hour hearing, which they've got to be brought from the district judge, or sometimes it could be the circuit judge standing in, or the city judge. At that point, they're appointed a lawyer if they can't afford one. Uh, once that lawyer is appointed, then they'll ask for a first appearance. And the first appearance takes place in what we call the district court, mm -hmm. which Judge Matt Horn is the district judge. Um, you come to the district court on the first appearance, Matt Horn, the judge, basically informs the person what he's been charged with. Of course, 90% of them know because mm -hmm. they were arrested on him. <laughs> um, ask him, can they afford a lawyer? If they say no, then he appoints them a lawyer at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes they get the lawyer at the 72-hour hearing. Sometimes they don't get a lawyer until the first appearance. Let me ask you this, Mr. 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 Attorney, for, for clarity, for understanding. Now, at what point uh, the district attorney is involved in this? From the arrest well, or once, after court, before court, or when, when? Once they come to the first appearance, we always have a prosecutor at the first appearance. Okay. One okay. of my assistants is usually there. Okay. But that's really more of a day to where they're informed as to the charge, you know, the, the time that they would serve if they are the actual limits of punishment we call it. Okay. Uh, if they're charged with a class C felony they're up to uh, 10 years in the penitentiary. If it's a class B felony it's two years to 20 years in prison. And if it's a class A felony they're charged with is from 10 years up to 99 to life. Mm -hmm. So they're informed of all that. They're informed of their rights and they're given an attorney. Usually after that I assume they meet with their attorneys, they talk to them outside the court, and usually about two weeks later, they come up to what they call a preliminary hearing. And the preliminary hearing is uh, still in the district court mm -hmm. under Judge Matt Horn. At that point is when we put on our case before the judge. Mm -hmm. uh, we usually call the victims in, or we call the, a police officer that comes in. At that point, hearsay is admissible in preliminary hearings. In other words, a police officer can read a statement from a witness without having to have the witness actually be there, like you would at a regular jury trial. Okay. That's preliminary. That's so. preliminary hearing. Okay. We call okay. It. And again, we're still in district court mm -hmm. under Judge Matt Horn. Well, Judge Horn hears our case. He hears what the state puts on. The defense attorneys have an opportunity at that time to cross-examine any of my witnesses that we put on. Police officers, victims, whoever we decide to use to present our case to the judge. Uh, they they, they cross-examine them, they have a right, they can put on a, their case if they want to. They can let the defendant actually testify mm -hmm. on his behalf at the preliminary hearing. They normally don't, but they, they, they could if they wanted to. Um, what happens then is Matt Horn makes the decision, Judge Horn does, as to whether or not there's probable cause 
to bind the case over to the grand jury. In other words, do we have enough? Have we presented enough evidence to him to move the case from the district court to a uh, grand jury, okay. basically to the uh, grand jury? Two things. When you say state, you're talking about the district attorney office, mm -hmm. okay? And when you say if we have enough, the district attorney has presented enough evidence That's right. to convince the judge and to I, move I, forward. I should say the state, in okay. which we represent the state. Okay, so all right. Okay. That we have presented enough evidence, this case is good enough to go on to the grand jury. And I'd, I'd say probably 90%, 95% get bound over because they're usually pretty good cases once you get enough to get it past preliminary hearing to the grand jury because all we have to do is show basically there's enough there to get it to a grand jury. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, once that happens, and we usually, we have preliminary hearings this coming Friday. It's, that's unusual, but with spring break coming up, I think they're trying to get everything done before next week. Mm -hmm. um, we usually take anywhere from 10 to 30 cases to preliminary hearings. It just depends on mm -hmm. how many fall within that week or two prior that are set on the docket for that particular occasion. Let me ask you this. Going to the grand jury means anything? Because you, because you bind me over to the grand jury? It basically means that we've got a good enough case to get it out of district court in, to the grand jury. And we put on enough probable cause, as they call it. And what I mean by that is we've, we've shown the judge that we've met the elements of the crime, that we've We've had a victim testify, yes, that is the person who did this to me. Mm -hmm. Or a police officer testify, yes, I saw him actually breaking into the building, and therefore we arrested him. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's enough to where the judge said, well, okay, well, that's, they've got enough probable cause to bind that case to the grand jury. Mm -hmm. But now, one more thing, and then I, I'm sorry to cut you uh, uh, at the At the preliminary, the state is presenting theirs, but also I could present mine. That's right. And so it all depends who's the most convincing. That's right. And is, that, of, is that correct? That's right. Okay. A lot of times though, the, the defense won't do that because they don't want to put their defendant up under oath for us having an opportunity to cross examine. Right. They don't really, they don't put the defendants on a whole lot. Now they do, but it, it's not common. Usually the, the defendant will just stand there and let his lawyer do the talking. Mm -hmm. um, on occasions, if they do, then we've got a right to cross-examine. I've got a right to ask him whatever question I want to ask, which normally that wouldn't take place till, a, till it gets to a jury trial. Okay, I got. You. And even at a jury trial, a defendant does not have to. He does not have to take the stand. I ain't on. <laughs> I can't see. Okay. All right. Now, now let me ask you this here. Let me ask you this here. Let me ask you this here. I always, I always heard, I always heard that a jury is uh, made up of your peers. Right. Okay, so, so if, I, if I went to court, would it be 60 black males who are preachers? Uh, well, how, how you what well, I'm trying to get, define, define, then, then <laughs> define we, peers for Let's us. get, once we get everything bound to the grand jury, okay, and usually it's probably, it's usually six months of cases that are made that go to the grand jury. We have a grand jury, in the Ufala Division twice a year, usually in February and then once again in August. We have a grand jury in Clayton, January and maybe June. And then Bullock County's grand jury is usually uh, April and I think November. So we have two grand juries a year in both Ufala Division, Clayton Division and Bullock County. Mm. So, for example, the grand jury we had this past uh, February, we took all the cases from the prior six months that had been bound over to the grand jury in district court. Those were presented to this past grand jury that we had. Mm -hmm. The way the grand jury is selected is you've got, you've got, of course, each judicial system is made up of the criminal division and the civil division. Well, the criminal division is when we prosecute the criminal cases. Mm -hmm. We call in a binary, and when I say a binary, that's when you call in a hundred and some people to come in to be struck or to be picked as a jury. Well, the civil lawyers, the ones that have civil cases where they file suits and so mm -hmm. forth, mm -hmm. they actually have the same two weeks to try their cases in, so he, David Nix, sends out for you know, a drawing of maybe 150 people that come in 
the civil attorneys, that's when they pick their jury trials. They pick the people or select the juries for the civil cases. Mm -hmm. But before they select the juries, what Judge Smithart does, now they were up in the circuit court with the grand jury, Judge Smithart, what we call it, he randomly selects, is the term he uses, a 18 people. And the way he does that is he goes down the list of everybody who's there that day. Say there's 100 people who showed up for jury duty. Well, he'll pick, you know, he might say, okay, I'll take the second one down and then pick every third one. Or the first one down and pick every fourth one. Just the numbers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so he randomly draws a grand jury. Has no idea who they are, you know, race, anything else. It's just a random draw. Here it is, you're number two, you're number three, you're number four, until you get 18 people. Who and the people are not actually sitting there in front of them. No, well, there's 100 people out there. Okay. But he'll pick them. By he'll, number. He'll write them all down, and then he'll, he'll call them out. He'll say, Mr. Smith, you've been selected for the grand jury. Mr. Jones, you've been selected for the grand jury. All the way down until he calls out those 18 people. Mm -hmm. That's your grand jury. Uh, it's not a matter of picking who the grand jury is. It's not a matter of saying, I want them, I want them. It's whoever you get. Okay. It's right. the 18 people that he randomly selected you know, whoever is, is the grand jury. Right. So what we do then, and let's just say we're talking about the Ufala grand jury, mm -hmm. we take them downstairs to the uh, county commission's room is where we handle grand jury. They basically come in, those 18 people, you know, room about the size of the room we're in, and we've got a long desk, and they just, all 18 sit around that desk, and I'll sit at the end of it, and I'll have a chair for my witness and my police officer. And once we get started, you know, first of all, the judge comes in and he has to, to give them an oath. You know, y'all have been selected as grand jury and they have to swear to this oath. Uh, one of the things they have to swear to is secrecy. And he informs them very strictly that this grand jury, all grand juries are secret. And it's a crime to divulge anything that takes place in the grand jury. Uh, anything, anything a witness says, any evidence that's presented, anything that takes place behind the doors of a grand jury that's divulged outside that grand jury, it's a crime. Okay, now when you say secret, that means to me when I hear the word secret, that means I don't even know who's on the grand jury. Is that so? Well, no, that because they're called out in the public court. Okay, when okay. he randomly calls out those names, I mean anybody who's in there knows. No, that's the grand jury. What's secret is what takes place in the grand jury. Okay. Now, okay. You know, I'm sure a lot of grand jurors would, would wish they were secret. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I bet you that's right. That, that's not the case because it's, it's called out in open court. Okay. Uh, huh. But once they get in the in the grand jury room and we start presenting evidence, and we start talking about people, and we start saying, well, you know, this person's charged with this, and we lay out all the evidence. Anything that's said in there stays, stays in that in there. room. You know, you can't go out and say, oh, we. We looked at a case against such and such, and you wouldn't believe what was said in that grand jury about that. You know, if it's found that they have violated that secrecy oath, then they can be prosecuted for a crime or misdemeanor. I didn't know that. Um, so who, who controls? Who controls? I'm sorry. Who controls the grand jury? The, the judge controls the courtroom. Right. Okay. So after he gives the oath in, in the grand jury, who controls the grand jury from that point on? Well, is there such thing as that? That's what we do. Y'all, okay. That's right. And what we do is prior to the, prior to our days, we have a grand jury. You follow is usually, it's usually a two to three day grand jury, where Clayton is usually a one, one and a half maybe. Pula County is usually a one and a half to a two day grand jury. You follow is always the longest Long. grand jury, mm -hmm. but we've got more cases here. So what we do, probably starting a month prior to grand jury. Uh, one of the secretaries starts going through all the cases. You know, she'll get a list from David Nix of every case that's been bound over to the grand jury from Judge Horn. Mm -hmm. And then we start pulling those files, and she starts going through them, and she starts making the witness list of who all would need to come testify at the grand jury. And it's basically a subpoena. We mm -hmm. subpoena those right. people who we're going to need, whether it's a victim, whether it's law enforcement. Um, that's usually your main two. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or an eyewitness or somebody that saw it went on. Those people start coming in, everybody starts gathering downstairs, and then you know, we've got a what we call our grand jury docket. It might be a hundred pages. And we start, you know, we'll select a certain group of cases to go first, and we try to 
sort of to where it's sort of similar crime. Mm -hmm. Say we got a hundred drug cases, we'll sort of do those one at a time, back you know one after another. That way, they understand the laws involving drugs. Mm -hmm. and then we'll put a group of say theft and burglary cases together. That way, they're understanding what theft and burglary are when they're hearing these cases. And we explain the law to them. We go through the law about each case and tell them what we have to prove and while we're presenting the cases. But back to what we do, we'll have one of my investigators stands outside and he'll give me a case and he'll have the witness and police officer ready. I'll take one in at a time, sit them down, I swear them in under oath, and then I start questioning. And I just say basically, you know, you made an arrest on such and such a date uh, against this particular person for this particular crime. Uh, if you would tell the ladies and gentlemen of the grand jury what facts we have here, what your investigation showed. So that police officer under oath will testify to the grand jury, this is what happened. Um, when you have cases involving people who are you know, assaulted or raped, uh, those victims will come in and they'll tell what happened. Uh, you know, a lot of times an officer will also tell his side of what his investigation, you know, revealed when he worked the case. Mm -hmm. um, the grand jury can ask questions. You know, if they've got a question for the police officer, if they've got a question for a victim, if they've got a question for an eyewitness, ask them whatever they want. And, okay. and they do that. I mean, we have grand jurors that, you know, they want to know course. everything. Yeah. They want to know why this happened, what mm -hmm. you did to make it happen, if you did anything mm -hmm. to make it happen. And they, they'll question them pretty good. Um, a lot of the cases have confessions in them. So once they read the confession, you know, pretty much they're ready to move yeah. on to another case. The mm -hmm. guy's admitted to what he did, let's move on to something else. Mm -hmm. After we present the case, then we walk out of the grand jury room. We can't stay in there. I can't stay okay. in there. Okay, okay, now, now police officers good. can't stay in there. It's just strictly the grand jury when it comes time to vote. Uh, you know, once I finish my witness, police officer, I'll ask him to be excused and I might ask the grand jury, do y'all have anything else? Any questions you have of me about the law or anything? And if they say, no, we're fine, and I'll step out of the room, and they vote just the 18 of them in there. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's a quick vote. One of the things that, that the judge does, Judge Smithart does, when he is you know, giving them their oath is he selects a, a four person. And each grand jury has to have a four person to sort of run the grand jury. Okay, okay. You know, and it's just one of the 18. Okay. Okay, let, let, let me tell you what, what, I, what I did. I, I used the wrong word on you. I, I used the word control the grand jury. Mm -hmm. That was the wrong word. Y'all just present your case yeah. to the grand jury, yeah. but the grand jury makes their own decision. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and every, anything that so far as what position somebody on a grand jury has, that's take place before they even get to you. Is that correct? Well, that's before Judge Smithart right. leaves the courtroom. Before, before he leaves the grand jury room, he's already... He selected a four person because he's got to swear that right. person in. It has nothing to do with you. No. That's what I'm saying. Absolutely. Okay, no, no, okay. all now, right. To be honest with you, he'll tell you right there, right now, that what he normally does is he likes to, you know, if there's a teacher, a school teacher, they usually make a better grand jury four person because they're used to leading people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, they're used to, you know, getting kids lined up and getting mm -hmm. them in order. So that's, his little, order. that's his little secret. Yeah, so he, uh, <laughs> but I think everybody knows that. But once we, uh, you know, once we start presenting our cases, we move on one at a time, and we walk out. They vote, and usually have somebody that sits by the door who will knock on the door when they're finished. We come in with another case, with another police officer or another victim or witness. Sit down. I open the file up. Here's the case, ladies and gentlemen. Swear the officer in. He testifies to that case. We leave the courtroom or the grand jury room. Walk out. Door shut. They vote. Talk about it. Um, is there a time limit? No. Once you present them a case and you walk out? They can take as long as they want to. And we've had, you know, cases over the years um, that they've, they've spent hours. Well, not hours, but they've spent at least an hour on a case before. A lot of the, those cases, you know, when you have some of the worst ones, uh, you know, child sex abuse cases, um, I can't really think right offhand what sure. some of the long ones are, but. You know, most of the cases, they move pretty quickly, mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they have to vote. They have to, I don't know, I assume if each four person does it differently, but most of them just do a raise of hands, mm -hmm. show of hands. Mm -hmm. And if you've got at least 12 people who have voted to indict, then, then you have an indictment. Okay. 
And what, what we'll do is we've got what we call a presentment in our file. Okay. And when the secretary, when she's getting all these cases together, she, she does a presentment and she lists the charges that they've been arrested for. And so we'll read, you know, the grand jury of the charges and when they vote, it's got a place to put, to check whether or not it's a true bill, which means an indictment. They check whether it's a no bill, that means there wasn't enough evidence to, to get it out of grand jury. Mm -hmm. Or they can check continue. They might say, well, this case, then I, you know, it could be a good case, but the police need to do some more work. They might need to go interview this particular person. They might need to do this. Let's just continue this thing, give them some more time to work on it. So I'll get them to check, you know, they check continuance. Mm -hmm. And then that full person has to sign her name on the presentment that this is what we mm -hmm. we indicted. Okay. Now let's 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 uh give me some definition of uh, some some of these legal terms you're using. Indictment. That's we still haven't got to the point of innocent or guilt. Mm -hmm. All all we're doing is saying what you what you did from the start back at Judge Horn. You put enough evidence to say we can go forward. That's right. And and, and that, is that the same thing the grand jury? Because most of us believe that the grand jury is the one determined guilty and innocent. And that's why, you know, a lot of the general public doesn't realize the process that it takes to get a case from the actual day of arrest to a, a jury trial conviction or a plea of a guilt conviction because I told you it's a six month build up to each grand jury because mm -hmm. this only meets twice a year. Mm -hmm. So if that person got arrested, say the the week after a grand jury meets, well, that case won't come up till six months to another right. grand jury. Right. Right. So it, you know, it's it's always gonna be a delay from the, an arrest to an actual grand jury. Uh, but yeah, once you get into the grand jury, we have to present enough evidence for the grand jury to say, Okay, Mr. D. A. it's that's a good enough case to go on up to a jury trial. You know, we, we think you got enough, at least 12 of them have to vote, 12 out of 18 mm -hmm, have to mm -hmm, say, mm -hmm. there's enough evidence there to move this case on mm -hmm. up to a jury trial. Mm -hmm. And, or into, you know, circuit court to be dealt with, whether through a plea or a jury okay, trial. Okay, now that's what I wanted to ask you about. So it's not automatically a jury trial from the grand jury? Mm -hmm. And there's other options that oh, yeah. you yeah. have? And what we do then, say after the third day, um, and they'll know bill cases. I mean, all grand juries are going to know bill cases. They're going to think, based on the evidence and the testimony, they might say, that that case, that's not a good case. Might as well no bill that thing here. Yeah. That's a waste of course time. Um, and the grand juries, you know, they know bill cases. But the ones that are indicted, for example, let's say we had 250 indictments. Well, what we have to do then is turn those indictments over. I have to sign them, Judge Smith Horton has to sign them, and the four person has to sign again the actual indictment. Those are turned over to David Nix, turned over to law enforcement, and then these particular people have to be arrested again. But what they do most of the time is if they've already been arrested and made bond, they're not rearrested. Okay, okay. They're actually just, you've been indicted, their lawyers know they've been indicted. We move into what we call an arraignment then. Now, we've moved out of Judge Horn's court, the district court, gone through the grand jury, and everything that was indicted in the grand jury now moves into circuit court, which is Judge Smith. Smith Hall. Okay, okay. So now, we're all everything's out of district court, we're in circuit court. Okay. The arraignment is usually, we had an arraignment this past Monday, uh, which was our second arraignment that we had. After grand jury, I'll go ahead and look at the cases and I'll make an offer to the attorneys as far as your person wants to, your individual wants to plead guilty, here's what we would offer that they plead to. Well, they start talking to their clients and they meet with their clients and they talk back to me, well, you know, he wants this and he might want a little bit less here. Uh, so throughout that two week time period, we're negotiating back and forth. Well, come arraignment day, they have an opportunity to come in and uh, either plead guilty if they want to, or if they say, well, I'm not ready to plead yet, I need a little more time to talk to my lawyer, then judge sets it for a second arraignment, uh, what we call a supplemental arraignment. That gives lawyers a little bit more time to meet with their clients, meet with me, 
and basically try to work out a best plea for them. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're trying to, you know, do the best plea for representing the victims in the state. Mm -hmm. And then we come back with a supplemental arraignment, and more people will plead guilty. Mm -hmm. Now, at some point during those two weeks, you'll, you'll have people say, "I ain't pleading anything. I didn't do it. Y'all gonna have to try me." And so that's when we start being able to figure out what's going to be tried. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of what we're doing now with the cases that were indicted out of the uh, February grand jury. Mm -hmm. Is that's these last two weeks? That's what we've been meeting, trying to figure out right now what's actually going to try uh, this coming up April first. It's when we have jury selections. Let me ask you something, Mr. Dick. Go, go on. I, what I'm trying to see now, if I if I hit. Ron in the head with a hammer. Is there is there is there uh, something that says that if you do this, you get this? And how much flexibility do you have with that? Is there a such thing as that? You know what I'm talking about? Well, for example, hitting Ron with a with a hammer. A hammer is going to be considered a deadly weapon. Okay. So that's going to be an assault, second degree. You didn't you didn't kill him. You didn't cause serious physical injury to him. Uh, you didn't cause a life threatening injury. He just busted his head open, he had to get stitches. But the fact that you used a deadly weapon, which a hammer would be considered a deadly mm -hmm. weapon, then you're charged with an assault second degree. Most of the assault second degrees we have are a cutting, knife cuttings, or even shooting. That doesn't, you know, say the bullet just grazes, goes through right. the but doesn't cause serious physical injury. Mm -hmm. The person just has to go to the hospital and get sewed up, even though he was shot. Mm -hmm. That's still assault second degree. Um, What you do they next close. is, uh, oh. got coming here. Yeah, they close. They still, they serve good food here, so they're yeah, coming all the People time. still coming yes, all, sir. all after Yes, sir. Uh, uh, but, you know, that's sort of what we look at. Okay. And, you know, we start looking at these. Now they've gone to, and let me just touch base on this real okay. quick. The Supreme Court and and the legislature has come down with what they call guidelines. Okay, that's what I'm looking um, Guidelines basically are, are is, sort of like a mathematical formula that you plug in numbers, you plug in if the person has had actual prior convictions, if they've had prior youthful offender convictions, uh, how many cases they were committed, the degree of the case, what type of case it was, whether it was a A, B, or C felony. Um, and all that's taken into consideration on these guidelines, and then that guideline will give you a range of punishment. Okay. So we're sort of limited now. They, they used to be they were voluntary, and we were trying to follow them because a lot of the judges around the state were, knew they were going to become mandatory mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. They have become mandatory now for your property crimes and your drug crimes. Now, the violent crimes are still, you know, they're not they're not making us follow guidelines mm -hmm. on, on the violent crimes. Now, is, is, now, is this is this each state different, or is this, yeah, this is federal? Strictly. No. Federal is totally different. different. Okay. But it's a lot of it's based on the same type of federal federal health guidelines. Right, okay. Uh, okay. And a lot of the other states are going to these guidelines. And what they're trying to do with guidelines is to I think a committee that was formed probably in the mid two thousands, two thousand six, five maybe, they started looking at the disparity in the different sentences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and you know, mm -hmm. you might have one county that was given two years for a drug possession case and another county given eight years, or somebody given five years on a distribution case, another county given 10 years. Mm -hmm. So what they were trying to do is just sort of, it's all about the prison system, it's mm -hmm. all about trying to alleviate overcrowding in the prison system. Okay. And so instead of these people getting 10 years and being sent to prison on a drug charge, when down in, in another county they won't be getting two years and getting probation, mm -hmm. And the prison system was getting overcrowded, and that's when they came up. We need to get everything sort of on the same page all around the state so that we can start alleviating population in the jails, mainly for your violent criminals. Yeah. Now, now, when the Attorney General of the United States said that, that's basically what he was talking about. Well, Did you hear his statement? I didn't, but he's talking about federal guidelines. Okay, okay. The federal court system is totally different. Than okay, the state okay, system. okay, uh, okay. It's just. So he, he said he said minor minor drug offenses. Well, and that's what they you know. do. They've got they've got guidelines in the federal system based on the amount of drugs you have. It's a different sentence. If you've got amount of drugs here, it's a higher sentence than if you've got a small amount of drugs. Um, anyway, that's that's strictly the federal system. Mm -hmm. okay. 
back to our grand jury and okay. just let me touch back base sure, on this. Sure. A lot of times we have cases that go straight to the grand jury. That don't there's not an arrest. That there hadn't been a an arrest made in first appearances, preliminary hearings, we have an opportunity to take a case straight to a grand jury. And we do that a lot, you know, most all death cases that happen in the city, whether it's a suicide, whether it's a car accident that involves a death, um, whether it's a, a situation that probably would be better taken straight to a grand jury than warrants issued, we can take a case straight to a grand jury. And what that does, it just alleviates all the district court stuff. Because every case, like I told you earlier, has got to go through the grand jury. Right. But now you said, you said, when you say go, go on, and, and understand, I'm just a layman out there well, on the speaker. That's what I want everybody to yeah, and, all the layman and, to understand. Yeah, and we appreciate, we appreciate you taking the time to give us the process. Yeah, that stops a lot of these uh, street lawyers yeah. from talking. Oh, yeah. But look, now, now, now this is what, I, this is what I, I heard you say that I don't understand. You said I can go straight to the grand jury without even an arrest being made? How do you know you got a case? Well, the grand jury determines that. Okay. The grand jury determines that. And let me give you a perfect example of most of the time okay. cases that go straight to a grand jury. For example, the county or you follow the police department run a undercover operation. And they bring in an informant and an undercover officer and say they make 20 undercover drug buys. And that took over, say, a two or three month period. Well, they don't arrest that person that sold the drugs right then, they just move on to the next. Okay. And to protect the undercover informant and the police officer, they don't arrest him right there. I got you. So that might go on for say three months with them making undercover buys from drug dealers. And so what they'll do, they'll sort of work it up close to the grand jury date and then they'll come in and say, okay, we've got 15 people here that sold drugs. We've identified them, we know who they are, we want to take those 15 cases to the grand jury. I got you. And so what we do is we'll, the law enforcement, the task force who made those cases will come in and present each one of them. And if they're indicted, then that's basically the arrest. Okay, I got you. I got Instead you. of arresting them prior to the end right, of the undercover right, operation, right. they wait till the, it's over with, they're through making all the cases, and then present those cases to a grand jury. Okay. And if the grand jury indicts them, that's the exact same thing as an arrest. Okay. It just skips the the district court process. Okay, very good. I thank you for explaining that. But um, <clears throat> one other thing I just want to mention to you. Sure, go ahead. Involving a grand jury is mm -hmm. some of the, it, it's a crime for me. It's a crime for the judge. It's a crime for David Nix. It's a crime for any court official to disclose the fact that somebody has been indicted for a crime until that person has been served with the indictment or informed that he's been indicted or arrested on. And so a lot of people will call after, right after grand jury, just such as just get indicted. My case get indicted. Can't tell you. The law you can't you can't tell the law. You can't tell anybody until that person is known to have been arrested on that indictment. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that. Right, and right, call right, me, you know, right. The next day, did my case? Did y'all indict the person who broke in my house? Ma'am, I can't tell you that right now. I'm not being ugly. That's just law prevents me from telling you that. Um, same thing for, for any witness who testifies for the grand jury. They can't go out and say, oh, I testified to the grand jury today about one particular case, and this is what I told the grand jury. That's a crime. Mm. Um, I'm sure that happens. Yeah. <laughs> you it's still be. a crime if yeah, it, it yeah, happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure we've had grand jurors who talk about the cases, but uh, it, it's, it's a crime if, it, if it's known and it's brought to us. Um, but basically, you know, once we've got all these cases indicted and we've worked out the pleas and the ones that don't plead, we have a two-week time period to try jury trials. Mm. Um, like I said earlier, that's what we're working on now. So trying all, to all the cases got to go within two weeks? Well, m most of them have pled at this point. Okay, okay. And you can say we're down to five that want jury trials. Okay. Then we've only got two weeks because that's just the way our schedules work to where you got to move on to, okay. to Bullock County next. Okay. So we're limited to really a two-week time period to try our cases. Mm -hmm. um, once you have a jury trial, 
Now the difference in the grand jury and a jury trial is, the jury trial is where we'll bring back in another venire, say the 150 people that are selected for jury selection. Mm -hmm. This time they're selected for the criminal court, not the civil court, mm -hmm. where we pick our grand jury out of. Mm -hmm. This time they're selected for us to be able to pick juries for criminal cases. And so they come in, they'll be here April 1st, and we have a jury selection. And if we've got three or four cases, or two cases, or one case, then you know we'll, we'll select those, we'll question them about the case, do you know the witnesses, do you know the defendant, their family, so forth. And once we get our 12 selected, and when I say selected, you don't pick them, you just take right. the ones off that you don't want you. on there, whatever's left right. is, is your That's jury. True. Let me ask you something quick before, before I forget. Once the grand jury hear the case from you, they don't sit in on, on, on another case. They sit, no. Uh, look, All look. the grand jury hears is every case is, is brought down over for the six months. After that, they... So they won't be part of the jury that's sitting out here in that case. Uh -huh. Okay. I and the difference is, the grand jury, all they've got to do is hear enough evidence to move it on up to the circuit court to the jury trial. And go home. Once you get a jury trial, you know, then we've got to prove our case beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. We've got to prove each element of the crime of that charge beyond a reasonable, reasonable doubt, which mm -hmm. is a high burden. Sure. Getting an indictment is not a high, you know, it's not as high of a burden. It's just, is there enough there? Right. Where to convict somebody beyond a reasonable doubt at a jury trial, you know, we've got to follow the laws of evidence, present our case the best we can as far as you know, can't have hearsay, you can't have somebody say what somebody else said, that person's got to be there to testify. Case over. <laughs> and, you know, then they've got to, all 12 of them have to vote, and it's got to be a unanimous vote for a conviction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where the grand jury, you just have to have 12 of 18 vote to indict. Mm -hmm. If you move up to a regular jury trial, you've got to have a unanimous decision to get a guilty verdict of the particular crime that charged them. That, that's the main difference mm -hmm. in the grand jury. I got you in an actual mm -hmm. jury trial. Now once the trial starts, is it open to the public? The public can go in? Yeah, absolutely, except for, you know, if it's a, a child sex case, you know, we, he usually doesn't let people in then. Now they're, you know, he's good about locking the doors. He lets anybody in, but he's not gonna let people come in and out during the trial. Right, right, It's right, just disruptive. Right. But once you get in there. You're in there, before he shuts the doors, then you can stay all day. And it breaks. People come in that hadn't been there or, or couldn't get in because the door was locked. Mm -hmm. They'll come in during the break, but it's just, you know, allowing people in and out all the time is just a disruption to the judge, right, disruption right, to the right. witnesses. Understand the that. Understand that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's open to the public. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, you, you you cleared up a lot of a lot of things that we didn't that we didn't that we did not know or we didn't understand. Yeah. You know, a lot of us watch trials on TV. Right. And you, you wonder sometimes how much of what you're seeing on TV actually takes place, you know, in the courtroom. Well, and, and a lot of the trials you see on TV are the actual jury trials where you're actually trying to convict the guy of a class A, B, or C mm -hmm. felony. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's strict rules of evidence mm -hmm. that you've got to go by. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing like the grand jury. Well, one, one, day, one day when you give me some more of your time, uh, uh, I want you to explain to us how these different classes operate. Okay. But now, now, let me ask you this here: if you, if I, if I am, if I am sentenced by the jury, or uh, however, convicted the process, by the jury, convicted by the right. jury, and I get five years, mm -hmm. and then a year later you see me walking the streets of you fallen. What what causes something like that? What 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 might, what might cause something like that to happen? Usually, if you go to a jury trial and you're found guilty, you're not going to be walking the streets a year later. Uh, most of our jury trials that we that, that I've tried are all are murders, capital murders, uh, robberies, uh, child sex abuse cases. Usually, you know, your property crime cases are normally going to plead, mm -hmm. and if it's a first time uh, first time property offense. That person's probably going to get into the pretrial diversion program, uh, and, and the pretrial diversion program is an option that you know I could talk a whole day on that. But right. it's what I started in probably 2007, which allows a person who commits a property crime or a possession crime of, of drugs, or say a forgery, or you know anything that's not a violent crime, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to be able to 
to get into a pretrial diversion program, which we run through my office. And it allows a person to be in, in pretrial for a year, do what we ask them to do, which is community service, uh, court referral if it's a drug case, uh, has to pay all the fines, fees, uh, has to pay all restitution up front if it's a property crime, which there's restitution owed. If at the end of the year they've done all that, successfully completed it, hadn't got another cr another charge, mm -hmm. then we file a motion to dismiss that case, which keeps the felony off this particular person mm -hmm. for making, and I always say it prevents somebody from making a stupid mistake who made a stupid mistake yeah, yeah. from being labeled as a felon the rest yeah, of their life yeah. it gives them an, an opportunity yeah. if they want to take advantage of it they'll do what we ask them mm -hmm. do everything on time mm -hmm. and at the end of a year we file a motion to dismiss their case and it's mm -hmm. over now, well i can say it is on a personal basis a lot of people appreciate that that program a lot of people appreciate that program but now i just read in the paper right before earlier and, and this is always sticky. But now, let me say this before I say anything. You got, you got a good record on dealing with drug dealers. You got a good record on that, you know, streetwise. Yeah, but not, but trying now, to be fair with everybody. Yeah, but this is, what, this is what it seems like, though, Mr. District Attorney. It seems like that if I'm a major drug dealer, if I'm a major drug dealer, I never do the complete time that, that, that that's given me because I'm right back out there. And, it, it just it does just seem that way, or is it is it, it is it something in the system, a loophole, or something in the system that can put me back on the streets? Well, am I being fair with that question? First of all, yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. All right. First of all, all right. basically, just say for example, you've got a first-time possession of cocaine or possession of marijuana. Okay. Felony possession of marijuana. You don't have any priors. You've never been in any trouble. We're going to allow you to get in the pretrial diversion program to try to keep that felony off the of record. So okay. you're not going to do any time. Okay. Even if we didn't have a pretrial program, if you pled to a possession of marijuana felony or possession of cocaine with no priors, you're not going to go okay. to prison. Okay. And if you did get sent to prison, prison going to turn around and send you back the next day anyway because they don't want you there. Okay. <laughs> They're trying to I got you. keep you know small drug cases out of the prison so they can put the violent people in. Okay. Okay. Um, now, if you have a distribution case, you know, distribution is considered a whole class higher than possession. Okay. Possession cases are class C felonies, which are a year and a day up to 10 years in the penitentiary. Distribution is a class B felony, which is two years up to 20 years in the penitentiary. And a class A felony, which would be trafficking, mm. is a 10 years up to 99 or life in the penitentiary. Good. And that's just the way they, they differentiate between those types right, of right. charges. And it makes sense because trafficking is a lot worse crime than possession of mm -hmm, cocaine mm -hmm, or marijuana. Mm -hmm. uh, a distribution case won't get into my pretrial program. I don't care if you don't have a felony. You know, you're still not going to get in it. Because I can't get right there. That's right. And, and, and the law, the pretrial diversion law that we follow, it won't let them in anyway. It okay. excludes a lot of crimes and distribution is one of those that's excluded. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of times, say a first time uh, someone who missed, commits the crime of distribution, um, you know, they might serve six months in the county and then they're released. Now, if you've got one who's been there four or five times, then you're gonna get a higher sentence. Mm -hmm. If you've got one who's committed five prior, doesn't have to be distribution, Prior, five prior felonies, then you have what you call the habitual offender law, mm -hmm. and that bumps it, everything bumps up. So mm -hmm. if you've got a class C, it bumps it up to a class A mm -hmm. because you've got a certain amount of priors. All right, that is fading out with these new guidelines. The guidelines supposedly take into consideration how many priors somebody has. The problem I'm seeing is it's not near what the habitual offender law would have taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. So the sentences are going to be a lot less under mm. these new guidelines that we have to follow versus what they were Before. under the habitual offender. Mm. And, you know, and that's going to be an issue down the road because you're going to see, you know, people who you know, well, they've been through the court system three or four times and they've only gone two years. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why they've only gone two years because that's what the guidelines showed, that they only could go serve two years. Mm. And that's the, that's the frustrating part to us, to me, is it takes away 
you know, any leverage we have as far as, okay, this guy's been up here five times and he ain't learned a lesson yet. Right, right. Here he's getting basically not much more than this guy down here who only committed one crime mm -hmm. and, you know, it's just not enough disparity between the, the two right, sentences right, right. based on these guidelines. Right. Now, my, my, my dime is almost up, my, the <laughs> dime that I paid, but I'm really enjoying this and we're going we're gonna to do this again. But uh, t t tell me this here, the, the guidelines that you just talked about with this great disparity, who, who, who's setting these guidelines? Politicians or, it's, or who? I think I mentioned earlier, it's a committee, it's called the Sentencing, I can't remember what they call it, the Sentencing Committee. Right. And it's, it's based on uh, DAs, judges, uh, oh. people in the criminal justice system, legislatures, it's, it's probably retired judges, there's probably 30 of them on this committee, and they that's who they, and they worked on it. I mean, they've been working for almost 10 years on this thing, trying to get it ironed out to where it is right. Mm -hmm. um, it, it makes it easier on us as far as talking to, to people when we're trying to set a deal, work a deal. Right. Basically, here's what the guidelines say. That's, that's what, what I, I like can, what I can do, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, if you don't take it, I mean, I can't, can't do much better because yeah. that's what the guidelines say, and I can't do much worse because yeah. the guidelines well, won't let me. <laughs> so it sort of ties our hand, but thank goodness it doesn't on violent crimes. You know, your robberies, your rapes, right, murders, right. you know, that's still, you know. Get the hammer. Get the hammer. All right. Mr. D, I really, I really, really thank you for this, and uh, I, I really, really appreciate it. I know you're a busy man, and, and I really appreciate that you took time to come here and, and explain a lot of things to us. A lot of things we didn't know. Well, and, and, I, and I the hope process, that the process, yeah, yeah. The, well, the process yeah. is what we don't know. And that's what's bogging everybody's mind, the process. That, that, that's, well, that's what's causing us to say things that, yeah. you know, crazy yeah. stuff. Because right. we don't know the process. Well, and I, you know, I, I do understand that there's been concern about things taking so long. Right, right. And I hope that sort of helped explain. Right, that, right. We only have a green jury every yeah, six months. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, of course, you know, there are times when you can call a special grand jury, and, uh, and uh, there's probably a time for that fairly soon. So. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that happens. It doesn't happen very often, but um, mm -hmm. it does happen, and it has happened, and mm -hmm. it's probably going to happen. Well, after, after, after that happened, come back and explain to us what would cause something like that to happen. Would you do that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now, now I, I'm going to always give you the last word. If there's anything you want to say to our listeners. Uh, or anything that, uh, that I miss that you might think is important to tell us, we give you that time. Uh, I think the main thing is, I hope this sort of summary, Criminal Justice System 101, sort of helps everybody understand the process um, of what we have to go through to be able to get somebody to a trial or to get a conviction and then the sentencing aspect of it. Um, one of the main things I'd like just to say to anybody out there who's watching or listening is that, you know, and I said this to a group the other day, all I ask is this community, you know, come together, you know, join together, not only um, for, as brothers and sisters of, of God, mm -hmm. as children of God, mm -hmm. come together and let's work and do everything we can to stop the violence that's going on. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, I was left my office just a minute ago to come over here and I was putting together my second murder, capital murder case that I've done in the last two days. When I say putting together, I'm making my, my trial file. Sure, file. sure. And my office is nothing but boxes of murders and capital murder cases that I have to walk in and look at every day, you know, the names of these people who are charged with murder. And instead of them going down, they keep going, going up. up. And we've never had that this time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, within the last year, you know, just the violence that we've had is, is mm -hmm. It's not what we want in this town. It's not what we've ever had. And it's mm -hmm. definitely something that we need to all work together to, mm -hmm. to try to prevent. And I don't know if that starts with lecturing your kids, lecturing your friends, lecturing anybody you can lecture about. Leave guns at home. Leave them in the gun box. Leave them. Don't carry them around in your pants pocket when you go into nightclubs or when you go out places that there might mm -hmm. be problems. Leave the guns behind because you're not going to murder somebody you ain't got if you ain't got your gun. Mm -hmm. you, might get, you might get whipped. Or you might whip somebody, but you're not going to be charged with murder for doing that. And you know, I just—that's my thing. Is just, Mr. I hope Mr. everybody's on the same page. Let, let, let me let me say this to you, because I hear your heart, and I hear that cry all the time. But but believe it or not, believe believe it or not, Mr. D, it's going to take somebody like you in the position you're in, 
and the judges to really inform us. You know, you know, I, I know I know you put a lot on the home, but if I'm at home and I don't know, that's right. you understand what I'm saying? Now I know to tell you not to take your gun. Yeah. You, you understand what I'm saying? But 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 anybody that's you got children, I got children, and, and a lot of times our children hearing it from somebody else has a greater effect. Mm -hmm. you, you, you see what I'm saying? And, and if we if we see that y'all just sitting there to prosecute us, yeah. that makes it harder to get the message. So it takes somebody like like you. I hear your heart. Please believe me. I hear your heart. And 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 and, and it takes your office and the judges and somebody constantly informing uh, uh, the community. And, and that's one thing. And I'll say it right now to you, and I've said it to many others. I'm available. I'll come speak at any organization with kids or with adults you know I, if there's a kid that looks like they might be headed wrong I, I'd love to come talk to them I'd love to, them to come to my office see my office I'd love to go to their house and speak to them one on one just tell them look it's not worth it I promise you it's not worth it because once you get into the system once you've done that one stupid crime right. and the worst stupid crime you can do is to pull a gun and pull a trigger at somebody <laughs> and because you're done yeah. and it happens like that it happens mm -hmm. so fast and, and I you know, I tell people this all the time. I'm like, you know, one minute you were having a fight with this guy, you were in an argument. You know, y'all were going at it, maybe over a girl, maybe over, you know, something else. And you next thing you know, you did the stupidest thing. You reached in, pulled a gun, and shot. Mm -hmm. And now you're here for murder. For one, for that split second of doing something that you just weren't thinking, you mm -hmm. reacted. You pulled a gun, and shot somebody. Now, mm -hmm. my only choice is to. Prosecute you, and you're going to be sent away mm -hmm. to prison for murdering somebody. I mean, and it takes that long to pull the trigger and kill somebody, and then your, your life's over. All I mean, you're done. And uh, you, that, that's what I. You, you heard it here live on Gumbo Live. You heard the district attorney say that he's willing to go the extra mile. He's willing to do whatever it takes. His office is available to us. So when we get tired of the crime and we want to stop it, and we say we don't know the answer. You heard it live right here on Gumbo Live. The district attorney himself said, am, am, am I quoting you right? We're we had to go the extra mile, whatever we, need, whatever we need to do. So let's get behind him. Let's organize as a community. Let's come together as a community. Let's make this city, this county, the very best that it can be. And we got the help. We got the help right here. That's all we need. Listen. Gumbo Live comes on every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Again, we want to thank the district attorney for, for uh, uh, informing us and, and not only informing us, but offering himself to us. And, and I think that's the best we can do. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. District Attorney. Thank you. God bless. Thank the Bread Basket for allowing us to come. Absolutely. All right. Come eat here. It's great food. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> you heard a great endorsement there now.